I just got back from vacation. I, uh, I've just started this new thing called Facebook, and uh, so I've been posting a little here or there, so some of you might know. I like to go to Kentucky. We have a place down there in the bluegrass. Now, I know when I say Kentucky, people think of those shows on television, you know, the hillbillies and, and all the crazy things that happen down there. And I'm, I'm in a different area, the, the Louisville area, and the Lexington, this, this wonderful thoroughbred bluegrass region. And whenever I go down there, I remember that there are different people and there are differences in our world. There really are. Down there, there's this idea of being genteel, the southern way. They may think of you differently in their minds, but they treat you well. The waitressing and uh, just, just, just impeccable. They're right there for you. They, they have this high level of service down there of coming and making sure you feel comfortable. And that's a wonderful experience when you go down there. Not saying we don't have that here, but there's just, a, just another standard down there. And boy, they say y'all a lot, and they have this different vernacular down there. They wear different clothes. They wear all these like horse-type boots that all come up to here. And the, they, they, they just live in a different world than us, but yet we're, we're still all Americans, and so we can kind of get along with one another. We, we, we do that. Another thing about vacation that I love, speaking about weird and differences, is my family. Um, when you have five people in a car for 12 plus hours each way, they say that crisis creates bonding. <laughs> and after 12 hours with my kids, we are bonding so well together. Because each one of them is so different and unique, and they have a spirit about them. My daughter is called Trinity, and that's what she is. She's three kids in one, and she just... <laughs> So, at any rate, I love going on vacation. It shows me the differences in the world, and I begin to appreciate that in my family and the world around us. When it comes to our faith, it's the same way. All of you people in this room are different, and if you don't mind me saying, y'all are weird. If you don't believe that, give me five minutes with each one of you. You're different. You are just different. Those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior have something very special. And you are a part of something so amazing, so wonderful, this beloved community that is our church. It's just fantastic. But it wasn't always that way. Let's bring up the past slide here. When we go back to the Old Testament, this beloved community was, I would say, very closed Back when our faith was first formed, back in the Judean or the Hebraic tradition, the Hebrews of the past, the, the belief of the Old Testament, it was very closed. They did not have an evangelical wing of the Hebrew church. There was no outreach committee. There was no welcome center. In the Old Testament, you were chosen by birth. You were chosen by your nationality. You needed to be born of a specific nation, born into it. You needed to be in a certain area of the world. You needed to be of a certain nationality. That's very specific, isn't it? They were chosen. They were drawn apart. They were designed to be a remnant, their own little community. And their call, their mission was not to add to it. Their call was to preserve it to survive. And there were many ways that they did that and were instructed to take care of it. Again, they did that by nationality. They did that by, of course, language. In order to be part of their faith, you had to jump through amazing hoops. And part of that is to speak their language. You had to understand their written and spoken word. How many of people here have read the Bible? And even if you haven't fake it, just raise your hand. How many of you have read the Bible? Very good. How many of you know fluent ancient Greece? And just speak it, read it, write it. Then obviously you're not Christian. That's our native tongue. In order for you to be Christian, I need all of you to learn Greek now. And until you have that done, you're not Christian. Obviously, there's something else that's going on today that wasn't there in the Old Testament. They were required to learn their language. And even today, you've seen sort of those movies, maybe, if you don't have the Hebrew faith around you, where they have to speak 
part of their text as part of the rites of manhood, the rites of growing older. And so to this very day, they do require you learn their language. Let's continue on. Heritage and culture. In order to be part of the group, you had to look the same. You had to act the same. You had to be the same. And we're talking very strict dietary plans. I look in this room, we have very dietary plans. Varied clothing. Boy, you had to have on certain clothing back then. We all have different types of clothing in this room. It was very strict. It was very closed. It was very maintained. And not only that, you had to do other physical things to be in. How many of us here, if you had to cut off your pinkies to be a Christian, would do it? Maybe some of you really of the faith, right? Uh, how about circumcision as an adult? Um, that can be kind of rough. And so, you know, Paul and Peter are arguing about this in the New Testament, dealing with these issues. There were very strict I'm talking painful requirements in order to be part of the community. It was a closed community with no interest in growing, no interest in ev evangelical mission. It was closed. It was closed. But then something happened. This diversity all of a sudden flooded in. Jesus Christ showed up. He came to instruct. He came to open the floodgates. And once again, just like Jesus, he'll flip everything upside down. Everything upside down. If you were going left, now you're going to have to go right. If you were up, you've got to go down. If you were straight, you've got to go in a circle. Jesus just, just does this. And what we've been given, all of you today, is not a nation or a language or a heritage or a look. Jesus gave you the Spirit. For those of you who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you were given the Holy Spirit. That gift of all gifts that allows someone like me to stand up here in front of you, that allows you to come together and sing, that allows us to do everything that we do. And it happened, the delivery part happened at Pentecost. I don't know what pastor said last week. I was on vacation. I really didn't want to listen to it when I was on vacation. So I just assumed things. But I want to make sure he said a few things. One is, it's interesting when we look at Pentecost to look at the diversity we have in our church, to look at the Holy Spirit's work. What Jesus did to his apostles, look, did they not have the best seminary training ever, the apostles? They were with Jesus, right? Did they not have the best internship possible? They were with Jesus. They had the best credentials. They had the best experience. I don't know how good they looked, but, you know, there they are. They, they, they were impeccable in nature. They saw Jesus come back from the dead. They saw the holes in his hands. And what did Jesus tell them in Acts 1? You are not ready. Don't go anywhere. Don't say anything to anyone. Don't move. After everything they had done... Jesus looks him in the eye and says, don't you dare go out that door. Don't move. You are not even close. Kind of makes me feel better <laughs> a little bit. Um, knowing all everything they went through, they, they, they weren't ready either. There was something that they needed. Something so important that even the apostles with everything they had, their credentials, their experience, couldn't do. And that was go out the front door. And so we catch up with these apostles in a room, dark, doing what closed communities do, right? They shut the doors, they hide away. Don't know where they are, they just meet. So they are in this room, and that's where we catch up to them as we deal with the Pentecost. Acts 2. Now when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly they came from heaven a sound like a mighty, rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all together filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were, now there were, now, oh, by the way, before I continue, don't worry about that fire thing. Only a few of us get burnt. Uh, most of us are fine. So I'm gonna. Now there was dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men of every nation under heaven, there were many people. This is like ground zero New York. 
This is from every nation, Canadian, Hispanic, um, European, Asian, whatever nation you want to think about, they are in Jerusalem. This is a happening epicenter of the Middle East. They are there. All these different cultures are present in their language, in their customs, in their cultures. They are all present. Now, they were all dwelling here, and at this sound, the multitude came together. This was an event that not only the apostles were aware of, but everyone around was aware of. Every nation under heaven saw this and came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. Now, if you ever get depressed... If you ever go to too many council meetings or if you ever go to too many other types of organizational meetings, I want you to read Acts 2 over and over and over and over and over again. It gives us our purpose and our direction. In the past, it was closed, wasn't it? You close the doors. You make them conform. You have to wear a certain thing. You have to look a certain way. You have to say a certain language before you're even allowed to come in. But what happened at Pentecost? What did God do? He exploded the front door he gave them the language of the people and said, get out. And you have this amazing movement of the Holy Spirit moving them out the front door, speaking in their language, speaking to their culture. And I'm going to tell you right now, that is what sets Christianity apart among any other faith or religion. Every other faith and religion in our world requires you to do something great and massive in order to be a part of their community. To read a certain language, to understand a certain text, to cut off your pinkies, to do all sorts of things. You know what's required for Christian faith? Belief in Jesus Christ and the gift of the Holy Spirit. When that is poured down upon you, you know it, and your life is never the same. And it is an awesome, awesome thing. And so, this Holy Spirit comes on, and these closed community people come busting out the front door, speaking in the language of all these diverse nations. They were shut out before, now the arms are wide open. They were closed, they were lost, but now are found, and they are speaking the word of God to each one of them, speaking in their language, in their culture, with their references. That is an incredible thing. And so weird, oh, so weird. The people saw this and were amazed. No other religion does this. Even to today, we're the only ones with the calling to go out the front door, to speak in their language, to go to their culture. The burden is on us. Now, look at all these different gifts. Look at the diversity of our church. Look at how amazing we are together. And they were amazed, right? I mean, this is not the Jews that were there. All these nations look at this going, that's not how you're supposed to do it. You have to earn your way in. What is all this? Well, why are you coming to me? Why are you speaking in my language? They were amazed. Are not all these people who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native tongue, the Parthians, the Medes, the Iliamites, the Mesopotamians, the Mesopotamians, really, the Judeans, the Cappadocians, the Pontusans, the Asians, Egyptians, Libyans, on and on and on, and the Romans, of course, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. The Holy Spirit was present and doing its work. And look at all the different nations that partook. All the differences. All of the talents and skills and gifts laying now in front of the church, ready to come together in this beloved community. What an incredible gift. What once was closed is now open. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for us? Well, our common thread is now not our clothes, our language, our house, a place. Our common language is what? What's the gift? I want to hear it. Well, what is the common thread now? Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit of God that is the thread now that binds us and holds us together. 
These differences of culture, of clothes, of style mean nothing before God. What matters now is that we use this diversity, these gifts God has given us through the work of the Holy Spirit together to form this beloved community. We all have distinct, I'm just using this word, distinct gifts. I want to kind of say unique or different. We all have distinct gifts. So we're all weird, right? We're all different. And when we use these gifts together, <laughs> it's amazing. And I don't just mean at our church. I mean when LifeGate and Lutheran Church of Master use those gifts together with Westside, with Christ Community, it's amazing what happens. Amazing. Amazing. I was taught a good lesson. I mean, it's like taking a thrashing. I, I, I learned a good spiritual lesson back when I was in Kearney. I, I was working on my singing voice. I have a speaking voice. It, I have the ability to fluctuate between certain ranges. And so I have the ability to speak a little higher, speak a little lower. And so I have a speaking voice. I, I've always worked on that. But I never really worked on my singing voice very well. And so I really worked on my singing voice for some time. And I was really getting proud of myself. I remember sitting in the pews, really trying to sing out those hymns, you know, amazing grace, you know. I'm in the right key. I might be in many keys, but I was in the, always in the right key doing my thing. And so I was getting really, like, I'm, I'm really coming on here. I'm really singing around. Well, one weekend, a guest came to our church. And he is a tenor from the San Francisco Symphony. He sat right behind me in the pew, and like all families with kids, we kept toward in the back. And so we're kind of in the back to the side, and this tenor shows up. He was a, a child to one of the, the parents there. So he comes in, and we start singing the first hymn. You know, amazing grace, and just kind of, yeah, I'm into this. I'm going to hold up the side of the church, you know, kind of do my thing. He waited to the second verse. Now I know why he waited. The minute the second verse began, this tenor if you don't know what a tenor is, that's someone who sings really, really well and really, really loud. Started singing. Everyone to a man and woman stopped singing and turned around as he began. And there I am standing there, <laughs> singing my heart out. Everyone's looking at me. Now I almost wanted to hide him and say, yeah, that's me. They were just built. Everyone stopped singing and turned around to see what was the matter. You know, what is this? He continued to sing and sing. And you know what the church did as soon as they figured out what was happening? They turned back around and started to sing the loudest that they have ever sung before. I've never been in that church where they have sung louder than when he was there. This man, who had the specific gift, who very few of us could earn money doing, came into the church with what God had given him and started to belt out and everyone in that room was blessed. And we all sang our hearts out because no matter how large you were, you weren't going to compete. And we just sang and we sang and we sang and we sang until we were oars. That's the diversity that we have. That is what's sitting in this room. And it's so exciting. I see people looking at me right now. And I've spoken with many of you and I see those gifts of the Spirit rattling around in there. And that is now our calling as a church. We have all been given distinct spiritual gifts and our differences are not just to be tolerated anymore. Well, that's their group, that's our group, that's traditional, that's contemporary, that's blah, that's blah, blah. What holds us together now is the work of the church to explode out that front door, to go where people are. Not only is it just tolerated, but it is required now. Through Pentecost, it is required that we come together with all of our wonderful gifts and become something that God has planned for us. I see that now, looking back at me. I'm really excited about it, to be quite honest. I know each one of you has something in you. And some of it I've seen, and some of it I'm just watching build up the Holy Spirit do its thing. And we as a church, we help each other do that. We walk each other along the journey we suffer one another. We coach one another. We, we do 40 days of inspiration together. We, we go and find out what those spiritual gifts are, to learn what those are. Because I've got to tell you, when you're doing those gifts, it's an awesome thing. 
And over time, this may happen, okay? I'm, I'm just saying, if the fire's on you enough, I don't think so. But it is a wonderful thing, and that's where our beloved community comes together. And the diversity that is all nations, all people, all styles, all whatever. <laughs> Praise be to God for Pentecost. I got to tell you, that is one thread from the tapestry of Pentecost. I am mean, being very specific. You could, I could be up here all day, but I'm not, I'm not. My time's up. Let us pray and thank God for what is done, that the Holy Spirit may rain down upon us today, that we may worship him. Let us pray.